Um, so good afternoon. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak at one of these meetings. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up on um, uh, something that Bob Dewar pres presented a couple of weeks ago, I think a month and a half ago now, on multi-region relaxed MHD. And I unfortunately opened my mouth at that meeting and said that it would be a good idea to use Euler Poincaré to do to construct the variational principle and that um, yeah then I got offered a, <laughs> a talk here um, and before I start I, I do would like to thank uh, Lyle Noakes who's been a, a tremendous mentor in, um, in, in the investigation of this Ola Poincaré technique and hopefully I'll present his teachings in the clearest way and if not I'm sure he'll jump in and correct me. <laughs> so the context in which we would like to apply this formalism and the ideal goal of all this research, research is to be able to contribute to this um, so-called magnetic confinement fusion which is the um, idea of harvesting power from a fusing plasma inside of a toroidal magnetic chamber. And here on the right, you see a beautiful um, rendition of the ETA tokamak, which is uh, being constructed um, currently in France, at the south of France. And uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, there was big news in, uh, um, that Emmanuel Macron launched the next stage of the construction, so namely the vacuum vessel, I think. And you can see or you could um, look it up on the BBC, for example, they reported that news. So it's exciting times, the exciting times for fusion. And we hope that within the next 10, 15, possibly 20 years, we'll demonstrate the feasibility of this solution. One hard aspect of uh, doing fusion on Earth is that a plasma is not particularly stable when you heat it up and you try and confine it and you try and compress it in a uh, toroidally shaped donut, uh, a magnetic configuration. And also its constituents are not particularly well confined if you start to deform the magnetic fields just a little bit. So you have to play between, you have to optimize both the stability and the confinement. And that's sort of the key to succeeding. And that requires a very fine tailoring or fine tuning of the magnetic field lines. And the two sort of concepts um, I, from a conceptual point of view, is to be able to layer your magnetic fields in such a way that you construct a fabric, um, like, like carbon fiber <laughs> um, um, tors torsion of field lines on flux surfaces, that's the correct term, or mathematically you want to have a foliation of your uh, donut uh, under the flow of the magnetic field. And that's supposedly very hard and I don't know of any proof that these things exist in general. So ongoing work to prove this. Another concept is to be able to twist the magnetic fields, so increase sort of the torsion or the, the braiding of the magnetic fields and that helps confine particles. And that refers to what is called helicity or rotational transform in the um, um, plasma community. So those are the two things that a theorist um, like me tends to study. And it's worth taking a look at the two competing designs of uh, fusion devices. The left guy is called a tokamak. It's the one that I showed in the previous picture. And it's based on the idea that the more symmetric you can make the device, the better it will be. Um, so you'll try and arrange these red coils that are roughly circular and planar. So to respect the symmetry, uh, the rotational symmetry around the vertical axis, that's not enough to give you the blue field lines, which are torsated. What you need on top of that is a strong current to be induced in the plasma. That's called, the, it's a toroidal current. And that induces a poloidal component to the magnetic field and the combination gives you the twisting to the helical structure of the fields. And the fact that you have to induce a current in a axisymmetric plasma is the source of instabilities. 
And it also um, makes your plasma, um, because of the time varying induction process, it makes those plasmas finite in time. So you only have pulses or discharges in a tokamak and these pulses, I can't remember the record now, but I think it's about five, 10 minutes a pulse uh, at best. Um, <laughs> and you have to repeat this process many, many times and get harvest the energy from that. In contrast, you might want to have a static configuration, which is this beautiful looking thing called a stellarator, where the complicated geometry of the field lines is imposed by tailoring the coils um, in such a way that you just uh, turn them on and you'll get a 3D torsaded field, um, static, stationary. So no currents and hopefully no instabilities, but then you have issues with the confinement. And confinement means particle floating around and um, starting to um, move outside because of the 3D nature of the uh, field lines. And also you have an engineering problem in shaping those coils and getting down to the precision, the level of precision you need to sort of avoid having um, complicated looking field lines. So there's an optimization and design issue here, um, which is part of the game. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating thing to do. This, this design, by the way, is, is the W7X Stellarator, which is currently in operation in Greifswald in Germany. And it's, it has some very promising results. And I should mention that Australia has been a leader in the study of Stellarators, uh, and Bob Dewar could also report on this, but I think the first Stellarator in the world was H1 and um, uh, at ANU back in the 90s, possibly. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, he's been decommissioned. Oh, Bob, are you on? Yes, that's the first uh, heliac, but it's not the first stellarator. Correct. Sorry. Yep, the first heliac, a helical device in the world. Unfortunately, being decommissioned and sent over to another institute. But Australia has strong leadership in this stellarator business. <laughs> And the question in terms of optimization, I guess, is how to model a plasma and how to model this accurately enough, but also crudely enough that you can crank, turn the crank of optimization. And possibly the first and coarsest model is called the magnetohydrodynamics, um, where you try to capture the essential physics of the plasma being a fluid, and you will, it, it will be a single fluid model of the resulting kinetic mess of having a soup of charged ions and electrons together, globally neutral, but susceptible to magnetic fields. And essentially, and let me show you these equations in their or full glory, <laughs> it's a beefed up version of Navier-Stokes, roughly, where you have a continuity equation for the mass density of the bulk ions, you have a momentum equation for that, the, the, the Eulerian velocity of the bulk ions, where on the right hand side, uh, in addition to pressure gradient and other terms, you have what is called the Lorentz force, this J cross B um, force, which tells, which physically is the uh, attraction of two filaments conducting, uh, uh, two current carrying filaments, when you have them close to each other, they tend to attract. And that's the uh, origin here. Um, and since you're bringing in ma magnetic fields, you also need to <laughs> solve Maxwell's equations. So you have one, two, three, four equations dealing with the magnetic field. So Ohm's law will tell you how to relate the electric field with the current through resistivity. Faraday law will tell you, or the induction equation will tell you how the Magnetic field varies with respect to the uh, electric field. Gauss's law will tell you that the um, magnetic field diversion is free. And Ampere's law will relate the current and the curl of B, and you neglect the so-called displacement current in these models because the time scale for that phenomena for light waves is so much faster. So you, you neglect that term out. And you need a, a closure because you've introduced a, a 
pressure, which is a higher order moment um, from the kinetics point of view. And the usual thing to do is to use an adiabatic closure where you um, where you um, where your entropy is an advected conserved quantity. That's that's a really <laughs> it's a mouthful. And so for those of you doing fluid dynamics, if you think you don't have enough challenge, <laughs> kindly invite you to <laughs> try MHD. Um, but um, if you want to understand this from a somewhat geometrical point of view, and if you want to extract out meaningful information of all this mess, it's useful to consider the limit, which is called the ideal MHD limit, where the resistivity goes to zero. And this is valid whenever your temperature is, you know, pretty hot. You have a very hot plasma, which is what you want in a tokamak. So you can sort of neglect the resistive effects and you combine, say, Faraday and Ohm's law to give you, um, I would call this the frozen in condition or the advection equation for magnetic flux, which is this one. So the time derivative of B is the curl of V cross B. And the way we should be thinking of this equation is that it's an advection equation for magnetic flux. So if you compute B dot a little fluid element, fluid surface, and you drag it along the flow of that fluid, well, that thing is constant. Um, and that's the only thing this equation is trying to convey. So maybe a little picture. You compute, you have this B going through a surface sigma. You compute, the, you compute the flux through that surface and you do the same thing a little later down the flow, you should find the same value. This is the, the so-called frozen in uh, condition of our ideal MHD and it, I think Alphen back in the early 1900s was the first to sort of make it a theorem so it has it, it has his name it's called the Alphen theorem of our ideal MHD um, so it's sort of a structural or maybe a, kin a kinematic type equation that you that you're carrying along and the other equation that you should be carrying along is the momentum equation and to make life a lot simpler, I'm going to work in a regime where the fluid is incompressible, so its density is fixed. So let's just say, it, say it's one. And I'm going to study the momentum equation, or at least tease out what it really means. Uh, where the right-hand side is, I substitute Ampere's equation, and I get curl B cross B, and I have this annoying gradient of p here which in fact really is trying to satisfy the condition of incompressibility at this uh, stage so i'm going to worry about this equation and that equation from a mechanical or geometric point of view and that's where euler poincare uh, method is has all its power i guess and i hope i can convey that and I claim that these two equations, namely the ideal incompressible MHD equations, is fundamentally the same or can be derived equ equivalently to the Euler equations of a spinning top. And indeed, if you sort of check how many terms you have on the left and on the right, you have a momentum equation on both cases. You have a time derivative of your velocity a time derivative of the angular velocity, multiplying the moments of moment of inertia. You have a nonlinear term, v dot grad v, and this omega cross i omega on the left. Um, and on the right, you have a nonlinear force, I guess, uh, the, the Lorentz force. And for the spinning top, you have a um, torque that comes from gravity pulling down the center of mass if your spinning top is fixed at a point which differs from the center of mass. And the gamma vector 
is nothing else than the direction of gravity computed back, sorry, computed back in the coordinate frame or the, the coordinate system of the body, the, the spinning body. And that's why you have a second equation, which is this one. It's an advection equation for the direction of gravity um, computed in the body frame, which is the same as in ideal MHD, the condition that the flux is being dragged or advected uh, through the fluid motion. So structurally, that's what you trying to respect that's what you your equation is trying to do all right please interfere if things don't make sense um, i'm happy to ask to answer questions as we go along so let's review which what, the, this framework um, under which this analogy can be made and the usual point of view is to start off with a set of PDEs or equations of motion to try and convert that into a variational problem or vice versa. And uh, what that means is coming up with an energy functional or something. And then once you have that, you can probe or you can maybe explain this variational problem from a, from a geometric point of view. Um, the classical example is what we do in, in mechanics. We have a Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus some potential energy. And you, de you derive uh, through the least action principle, the Euler-Lagrange equations, which are second order in your variables. And or, or sometimes you can relate the action principle to the fact, to the equivalent problem of finding geodesics on a, a configuration manifold. And playing on these three sides is usually where you can gain a lot of knowledge and information. And there's a bonus to doing this when your manifold has an additional structure, namely it is a Lie group. And on top of that, if you have a so-called left invariant metric, and I'll explain that in a couple of slides. In this case, your least action principle you can convert that into a so-called reduced action principle, where instead of having arbitrary variations, you have, you have to fudge around with the variations a bit, um, and I'll show that. And you'll obtain what is called the Euler-Poincaré equations, which live typically in the Lie algebra of your Lie group. And that's what these MHD equations, and that's what the Euler equations for the spinning top really are. I hope I can make that point. There's plenty of literature on this subject. It's somewhat of a classical thing now, uh, going back to Poincaré's original paper. But I think the guy that really nailed it for fluids is uh, arguably Arnold in 66. And I highly recommend that paper. It's, uh, paper. it's, it's just very satisfying to read. Um, anyways, let's dive right in. <laughs> If you, if you will, let's just um, slowly set up the scene. We're working on a system which can be characterized by an element of a Lie group as a configuration uh, state. And what is a Lie group? Well, it's a group, continuous group with um, elements that can be locally parameterized by coordinates in Rn. So an n-dimensional Lie group is essentially a fat potato in Rn, and uh, it has the structure of a smooth manifold. In addition to that, it has a group operation. So you pick two elements and you multiply them together, you get another group element. So you can travel around the group by multiplying things, and it's nice. There is a special place in the group, and I think I made a type, there's a typo here, this is, should be G, is an identity element, such that when, when you multiply it on each side, it doesn't do anything. And there are inverses um, to all elements, uh, written as G minus one, such that the product of G minus one and G give you the, this neutral element. And thinking of groups, Lie groups as manifolds, that means you can, um, construct curves. So you can 
you know, pick a family of these elements and you can parentize them with a time-like uh, quantity. And you can do that smoothly, I guess, continuously. And you can differentiate these things and you can now talk about uh, tangent vectors are on Lie groups. So namely you take a specific point G0 through which say several curves um, travel to, converge to, and differentiating each of these curves will give you a different vector, which is pointing in the tangent direction. And you call the collection of such vectors the tangent space at uh, element G0 of your Lie group. And the collection of all these tangent spaces gives you the uh, tangent bundle. And once you have a vector, or I should say that this, these things have uh, vector space structures um, and they can be related to, um, they can convey um, differential operators. So they're, they're related to derivations. Um, and with a vector space, you can give it an inner product. Um, for example, pick capital V and capital W to be two tangent vectors at the tangent space G. Um, pair them together, produce a real number, and um, make sure that this is a bilinear, positive, definite, um, uh, non-degenerate scalar operation. And you'll get what is called a Riemannian metric if you can do that over all the points of your um, Lie group. And after you've done that, you can access, or you can, in, you can start computing lengths of the curves you parameterize in the group by integrating the square root of the norm uh, of your tangent vector along the curve. And um, you can then classify all of those curves in you know, decreasing order of length. And there'll be, a, there'll be a, hopefully a minimum to this um, length functional. And you'll be computing or, or finding what is called a geodesic um, a curve that minimizes the length for a given inner product or Riemannian metric. And incidentally, this is the same or equivalent to um, minimizing or extremizing the so-called energy functional where you have one half of the norm squared of G dot evaluated along the curve. And it's usually easier to use this thing um, from an algebraic point of view. And now we're back in game to, um, you know, do sort of Euler-Lagrange type variations. And indeed, if you um, um, use this as a variational problem and you, you know, do the, the usual thing, you'll get the Euler-Lagrange equations for your curve on your Lie group. And it will be a second order type system um, to be solved. Um, so for now, you're not, you're not, you're not using Euler-Poincaré yet. You can, do, you can always do this once you have the metric on your Lie group. Something nice happens though, when you have what is called left invariance or right invariance. And before I explain that, I need to um, review the notion of left action on a Lie group. So there's a natural thing that comes with your group operation. Namely, you take an element G, uh, and you multiply on the left by any other element and you, you make sure that that thing is fixed, a fixed H, um, to give you the product of H and G. And that map is uh, effectively a diffeomorphism on your Lie group. Um, so for example, if you have a curve, let's say you have this curve parameterized with time and through you know, some po point you can differentiate that curve, you'll get a vector. By acting on the left by H, you'll displace this curve just a little bit, or I mean, by as much as you want, effectively. So let's call this curve um, HG. It's a new curve. 
but you can um, still differentiate that thing with respect to time. And by doing so, you'll compute a vector, right? Which I'll write as D of HG uh, at time T. Now that thing is a vector, not at the place you had it before, but it's now at a different place. So it belongs to the tangent space at H G. And I'm, I'm trying to justify what is called the tangent map, which is a way of going from G to H through the left action, that's L H. So you go from G to H G, but also you have somewhat automatically a way to convert vectors uh, G primes, so blue guys, into red guys, this vector here. And this map is called the tangent map. I think the best way to draw this is by forming a diagram um, where given LH, you can differentiate this thing with respect to an element of G and start mapping tangent vectors at G into tangent vectors at H G. And I'll use this map quite extensively. That's why I'm spending a bit of time trying to explain it. So the notation is, uh, I differentiate the map LH at a point G and I act on a vector V and that gives me my red thing here. <laughs> if I substitute for the correct curve uh, through which uh, V is constructed. And I'll use a little shortcut notation because that's a lot of symbols to represent the mapping between tangent spaces. Uh, I'll use this convenient shortcut where I act H bullet V to denote this transformation. It's a linear transformation. Effectively, it's the Jacobian matrix of the transformation if you could parametrize the left action on your group. Now left invariance is the property of your metric that it, 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 it plays nicely with this uh, left action. In other words, pick V, pick W at a given point uh, in the tangent space of a given point in G and it makes no difference if you start pushing all your points around by acting on the left by H using this tangent map. You get the same result as long as you're consistent with interrogating the metric at the right place. So in particular, and that's, and that's where it gets really nice, if you want to compute the metric at any point G, between any vectors, pair of vectors you have, you could probably use H to be G minus one. And in this case, you can substitute, you know, um, you can put a G minus one acting on V, V minus one acting on W, and you'll be interrogating this at a special place at the identity and the tangent space at the identity, mm -hmm. identity is called the Lie algebra. And for many reasons, it's a, it's a wonderful place to live in. <laughs> um, and that's the essence of uh, uh, Lie reduction, left Lie reduction. So whenever you need to compute an inner product back in your energy functional, you don't do that in the group. You pull everything back to the identity and hopefully there you can sort of identify this operation as being an inner product on the vector space at the identity, so the Lie algebra, um, where these, these guys are called left reductions, I guess, computed by acting with your tangent map, uh, pulling the vectors uh, to the identity. And yeah, we'll see what what that means a little later. But the picture is this. So you have 
uh, v and w to be you know, tangent vectors of curves at g and you're able to pull that thing or at least the dot product between the two back to this special plane at the identity and the lie algebra has well it's an algebra so it has a product uh, law that comes with it called the lie bracket um yeah we could we could spend a lot of time talking about it but point is for matrix groups which typically is uh, what we'll show for rigid body dynamics this is simply the matrix commutator um, so a b is uh, the, the bracket a bracket b is a matrix a times b minus b times a and that's absolutely remarkable thing um, in ideal mhd this bracket will be something else but not particularly more complicated than computing, you know, doing algebra in the corresponding space. So, so somewhat helps to compute things when you're living in the Lie algebra, and that's why this method is quite practical. Um, all right. So now, now that um, we have left invariance, we can rewrite our variational problem of making the action stationary by finding a suitable curve in the group as to find a special curve in the Lie algebra, let's call it V of T, and it's computed by performing this operation G minus one bullet G dot uh, along the way. And um, since the action was well, left invariant, you can compute it in the group so you can compute it in this way, or you can compute it in the Lie algebra. Um, and then the question, well, if you try to perform your regular variations in the group using the standard um, action, you'll get Euler Lagrange. And it's again, second order in the Gs, but you can equivalently perform um, a constrained variational problem and obtain what is called the Euler Poincare equation for V. And the nice thing is that it's first order in the um, Lie algebra elements. And I say that it's constrained variation and the reason is the following. So in the process of deducing Euler Lagrange, what you typically do is you have a starting point and an ending point. And you're trying to find the curve such that if you perturb it just a little bit, <laughs> the energy stays flat. So it, it doesn't vary. And I think the best way to do that is to have a family of curves parametrized by say epsilon. So you have a two parameter family of curves. And what that means is that you have a tangent vector um, that you can compute by taking the time derivative of your two parameter family of curves. But you also have a variation vector, which is computed by taking epsilon derivatives of your two parameter family of curves. And you can plug that back into the energy functional. So say you see this now as a function of epsilon, poor choice of um, symbols, by the way. But you make sure that when you vary this with respect to epsilon, you get zero, and that will give you your Euler-Lagrange equations. Now you can't do that automatically in the Lie algebra, because remember that these Vs are actually defined remotely in some sense. So the equivalent guy is being pulled back here. Uh, that's your V. So it's G minus one bullet DTG. And the and you have a second uh, of these vectors. It's the Lie reduction of the variations, which I think is orange here. Let's call it W. 
and it's uh, g minus one bullet d epsilon g. And well, they 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 they're constrained to behave in a consistent way because they're being built upon the same two-parameter family of G's. And it turns out, and this is, uh, I'm not going to prove that, turns out that the variation of V, which is the one you'll insert in your variational problem, minus the time derivative of your W, which is the Lee reduced, uh, the left reduced variation vector, they have to um, match their Lee bracket. <laughs> This is an absolutely beautiful little formula here. Um, and that's what you need to keep in mind when you perform the variational uh, calculus on the uh, reduced action. Now, doing that in general is a bit tricky, or, or at least too general, I guess. So I'd like to show an example of how this works for the case of rigid body dynamics, and hopefully it will make sense. Um, all right. So in order to describe a, a rigid body, the only thing you need is a rotation matrix that tells you how space has rotated for you. And a rigid body, what is it? What it is, it's a collection of points, um, you know, set in some reference frame. And each of these individual points, say x0, well, if you want to know how it behaves in time, you apply that rotation matrix R of t to the uh, initial reference point, and it will give you uh, its coordinate in time at a later time. Um, yes. Um, oh, and by the way, a rotation matrix is a three by three real matrix that is orthogonal, namely uh, the transposed is its inverse. And obviously for physical reasons, um, a, a rotating bo body, the, the, the transformation of space that conveys that has to be um, orientation preserving. So you just need that determinant of R is equal to one. Um, so the orthogonal property can be either plus or minus one, but you pick the, the obvious orienti orientation preserving uh, component. And the group structure is simply offered by matrix multiplication. Um, so once you have that matrix, and it's a time varying matrix, so it's a curve in SO3, you can compute velocities of all your little points. And once you've computed these velocities, say by differentiating R of T, you can compute uh, the energy, the kinetic energy of each of these individual particles, weigh, weigh them, give them the mass uh, or an infinitesimal mass to each of these particles, integrate over the whole volume, and you'll get uh, the kinetic energy of the whole thing. And it becomes effectively a um, operation on the tangent spaces of SO3, depending on where you are uh, in time. And uh, I do need to give you the left action. So pick, pick a rotation matrix and act on the left on say your curve R of T. Well, that's nothing else than multiplying S R together as in matrix multiplying. And this complicated, well, complicated, the tangent map related to this, where you differentiate R and see it as a tangent vector at R of SO3, and you map it forward onto a new location, or well, that's simply the time derivative of the matrix product SR. <laughs> and so it becomes S times R dot. And that is my, my bullet. Uh, it's the same thing as I wrote before, it's S bullet 
R dot in the world of matrices. This is a very simple operation. Now I can left reduce an R dot by operating with R to the minus one. And that will give me effectively a vector in the tangent space at the identity, which I'll call omega. And that thing belongs that thus that belongs to the, the algebra of SO3. And you can show, you can see that this is the space of um, anti-symmetric uh, three by three matrices. which is a remarkable thing, I think. <laughs> um, and it, uh, physically, it corresponds to the um, rotational, so the rotation, the angular speed, but computed um, in the frame, in the rotating frame of the thing. And to see this, let me go to the next slide. So any anti-symmetric three by three matrix can be parametrized by three coordinates. And the most suitable way to arrange them is to have omega one being on the second row, third column, omega two being on the first row, third column with a minus sign, and omega three being first column, uh, sorry, first row, second column. And so there's sort of a duality or isomorphism between um, anti-symmetric matrices and vectors in the Euclidean space and that map has a name it's called VEC so you translate a, vec uh, a matrix into a vector and vice versa I think the inverse is called hat map <laughs> which is nice because the the this thing remember this is the velocity vector of a um, point inside of the rigid body seen in the inertial frame and the fixed uh, lab frame and if you apply an r to the minus one to that that will give you a vector a velocity vector but seen as if you were spinning around with the body and it's the same as and you can check that the operation of omega acting on x zero is the same as taking the cross product between the vec, the, the vec version of the omega mm -hmm. and the initial uh, x zero um, frame uh, label. And also quite magically, the commutation between omega and a gamma anti-symmetric matrix is the same as uh, cross taking the cross product of the vec um, analogs and that gives you your uh, Lie algebra so you, whatever you can whatever you want to do on the Lie algebra SO3 saying matrix anti-symmetric matrix you can sort of translate everything into Euclidean space uh, using cross products which is quite fun the left invariant Riemannian metric that you get out of the physics is the one where you compute um, um, moments of inertia, and I'll skip that part, but effectively what you get is, uh, I think this is the easiest way to do it. You define the inner product on the algebra between elements omega and gamma, and you'll get the tensor, the, the, the metric tensor being the moments of inertia. So you take I omega and you dot product, and here dot product means uh, Euclidean, dot product uh, times gamma. That's your inner product. And then if you want to know where, if you want to know the Riemannian, corresponding Riemannian metric, just push things forward uh, with whatever G matrix, uh, R matrix you have. And so the action, which conveys rotational energy, is exactly this thing where you pull back your time derivatives of your rotation matrix to the identity or equivalently computed in the algebra by taking the dot product between I omega, that's usually called the momentum, angular momentum, dot omega. And so if you want to perform Euler-Poincaré 
or if you want to do the constrained variational problem, and, and we'll do that in the next slide, we need to stick in variations of omega, which are induced by variations of the R matrix, uh, in such a way that they appear as some eta dot, the time derivative of some, uh, the Lee reduced <laughs> variation, plus the cross product of omega cross eta. And eta here is the arbitrary Lee reduced variation in the Lee algebra. That, okay, let's do that. Let's compute the variation of the action in the Lee algebra. So that's the same as varying. I'm going to write this up. Varying these things, it's a bilinear operation, it's symmetric. So I'll just get twice the same thing, which is I omega dot my variation. Uh, dt. But I, know I need to respect this constraint here. So I'll, I'll put it in as i omega dot uh, eta dot plus omega cross eta. And then that, now I just need to extract out my arbitrary eta by integration by parts for the first term. So uh, I'll have a total derivative on i omega dot eta minus the, the other thing. So d i omega dotted with eta. And my third term here, which uh, if I, yeah, let's not be too cavalier, let's expand it all out. This is i omega dot omega cross eta dt. Uh, this is a total derivative, so it will give me i omega dot eta evaluated at the endpoints, but I want the endpoints to be fixed, and that means my eta has to be such that it vanishes on the endpoints. So I basically can forget about this term. And then the last thing, this is some vector dot the cross product of two vectors and by the rules of cross products, I can flip the order around if as long as it's cyclic. And if I'm not mistaken, this gives me minus d i omega dt minus i omega cross omega and this whole thing is dotted with an eta. And since the eta is arbitrary, well, if my, my, my energy function was stationary, um, that means it's zero when I do that. It, and, and if my eta is arbitrary, that means that this thing has to be zero at all points in time. And that's the differential equation, the Euler um, it's exactly the Euler equation for rigid body dynamics. Um, so that's, that's how it works. <laughs> it's really like, it's like clockwork. You just, you know, compute, um, cross products, dot products, things, play around with things in a compatible way. And you get Euler-Poincaré equations, which are the embodiment of these, um, um, it's a consequence, I guess, of the left invariance property here. Now, I definitely don't have time to do the same thing for ideal MHD. I promise you it can be done, and I'll skip the next two slides, but there's a structure, there's, there's a way to make this work for ideal MHD, and it would be fantastic to talk about this. But allow me to conclude, <laughs> sort of skipping over some details, that it's a very convenient, which Euler Poincaré is something that if you see it once and you understand it, it's very hard to unsee and forget. <laughs> and so I claim that using the, this thing, it might be useful or it might help you in um, applying it to 
other systems, in particular, I've personally applied it to the Vlasov uh, Maxwell system, and it works there too. We've applied that with um, Edo uh, Hivijoki and uh, Josh Burby to the um, guiding center Vlasov system, and it also works. And so it's, it's sort of a nice recipe to get, or satisfying way to get um, uh, conservation laws embedded in your variational problem. The structure uh, in ideal image is a bit more complicated. You need to use what is called a semi-direct product, and that builds in the notion of advection. And in fact, this trick can be used repeatedly if you want to enforce some advection equation using a semi-direct product uh, group structure. Um, an important point maybe for Bob, who was talking about the Eulerian velocity, fluid velocity to be a, a sort of uh, variable on its own or sort of a configuration space variable. I would claim that through this um, interpretation, it is an induced variable and therefore you can't use it immediately uh, to perform a, um, a, a variational type problem. And I think that's the better way to look at these, this uh, quantity. And right invariance or left invariance is the origin. It really is automatic uh, origin of relabeling symmetry in fluids. Uh, these remarks are a bit more technical, I guess. And um, yeah, we could spend you know plenty more hours discussing the resulting conservation uh, laws, namely for rigid body dynamics. Left invariance give, gives is oops left invariance is angular momentum conservation. It, it, it's just a fancier way of expressing that. Um, An MHD relabeling symmetry leads to uh, vorticity and helicity conservation, and it's a direct, uh, immediate consequence. You don't even have to think about that. So with this, I'm happy to take questions um, <laughs> and comments. Thanks for your attention.